now recording. Ten years ago, I was, well, September of uh, 2006, I was invited to a meeting of the Scientific and Medical Network in Rawtonstall in Lancashire. This was uh, the Scientific and Medical Network are a group of academics and scientists and medical people, hence the name, they're pretty good at actually mirror imaging what they do. Um, and they, they, they have groups all around the country and in fact around the world. And I, this was my local group. And the reason I went up there was that um, a writer friend of mine called Evelyn Alassa Valorano was speaking. I hadn't actually met Evelyn, but I had been in contact with her by writing. She's an expert on near-death experiences and such like. And I drove over to Rawtonstall. Uh, and in fact, it was quite a fraught day because my wife and I were on were due to go on holiday the next day, so we had to leave early from the event. And when we arrived there, uh, there was the normal group of people, uh, and in the group was this incredibly smartly dressed guy who looked like he could be a consultant surgeon or something, and he really stood out. And um, I got chatting to him and, and discovered that he had had the most amazing near-death experience. And in fact, that's why he was there, um, because he knew Evelyn from his own research. And from then onwards, um, Bill and I, Bill Murtha, who was the gentleman, have now become very good, very good friends. And we've been in contact now over the last 10 years. Now, the reason I was very keen to have Bill as a guest on the Anthony P. Consciousness Hour is that I consider Bill's near-death experience to be the most amazing experience I have ever come across. I've written about it on many occasions in my books. But if you have never come across this experience before, this will blow your mind. Bill has written a book on it called uh, uh, Dying for a Change, which is well worth checking out. But it's Bill's story beforehand, and it's his story afterwards that is totally fascinating. And the one thing I will ask Bill is we have to leave until the end how you eventually were saved, because that's the bit that always is the gasper at the end. That is the one that really pulls it all together in the most uncanny way. So first of all, Bill, welcome to the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Lovely, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. And, and you, you're still down in Devon, are you? So you're, you're in your little oh. home. Yeah, I'm still down in Totnes with me and Jane and uh, enjoying the sunshine. So yeah, we're here, right in the heart of Devon. Right, because it was in the Devon coast back in, as I recall, 1999, that the events took place that were to change your life. So can you tell us a little bit about your background first? So can you lead up to how you were riding along the sea wall on that particular day? I think it was April 1999, I think, if I can recall correctly. But can you do a little background about yourself? And then we can build up to the events that took place that fateful day. I mean, very quickly, because um, I know you just want a brief background, but, you know, I'd, uh, I've got two brothers and we'd grown up in East London and um, we'd had a very hard uh, childhood. My father was an alcoholic. And um, so the three of us were very driven. Um, none of us went to university, um, but because we had a background of sort of, you know, a really hard background, a tenacious sort of um <laughs> background of growing up in childhood we we both well all three of us done very well in um, business so I'd gradually you know from a personal point of view I've worked my way up through uh, sales organizations in the construction and development industry and um, up to 99 I've got myself as a um, you know as a directorship in a very big uh, organization called Taylor Maxwell and uh, we supplied a lot of um, house builders and contractors and um, you know it was a million miles away from where I'd Sort of started, you know, at the ground level. Um, we had sort of 200 odd people, and um, you know, turning over quite a lot of million in the hundreds of millions. Um, but the pressure, you know, I'd not, um, uh, I've not really at that stage in '99, just before the accident, got used to um, the pressures of sort of managing a lot of people and a lot of money. Uh, I had big, big bonuses, and um, I think with the pressures at that stage, it was just starting to. 
to, to you know to um, affect me in different ways you know I, I now know in retrospect that was starting to sort of you know I had a shadow effect really starting to hit my um, consciousness level and um, and you know doing a lot of drinking there was a drug issue there and um, there's sort of lots of things that you know I was running away from reality really um, and typical man typical British man um, you know I didn't really open up to it and tell anyone about it or talk to anyone about it you just try and bulldoze your way through um, very arrogantly, ignorantly, and um, and try and pretend that you're going to get back online. But of course, things don't happen like that. And um, yeah, that, what I used to do, I used to sort of, um, I was away a lot, had a very, you know, high pressure job, so I was away a lot. But when I was at home, I used to like to ride down on the on the coast for a sort of five mile bike ride because it was a good way of sort of really pumping, almost sort of, you know, hurting yourself to to sort of just burn that sort of, you know, that um, that pressure out of your body. And um, yeah, on that one particular night, I was riding along the sea coast wall, um, just close to my home in Dawlish, which is near Torquay. Yeah, just to explain to any listeners who are in the United States who may not know the geography of the UK, um, Devon is in the extreme west country, and, uh, and it's the Nutton Institute that actually points out into the Atlantic Sea. Particularly beautiful part of the country. Um, very, very nice in so many ways. And there is this amazing seawall that runs down fr- uh, uh, from Dawlish or, or into Dawlish along the X estuary, which is this huge river estuary that runs out into the English Channel. Um, and as you'll particularly imagine that uh, in the UK at that time of the year, which is this time of year now, really, um, although the weather can be quite reasonable, it can be extremely cold in the water. But what happened to Will is strange in the extreme. So without further ado, this is what happened to Will. <laughs> I mean, just to sort of give it a, a background as well. I mean, we're only sort of about half an hour from um Plymouth, which is obviously where the Mayflower went off to America. So, um, you know, we're on that western sort of tip of the um, of the UK. Um, but coming back to the story, I mean, I can re- when I left home, the funny thing is, I had a gut feeling that things were very different um, that particular evening. I didn't know why. I just had that underlying feeling in my stomach as I left my home, you know, and grabbed my bike to go off to the uh, on the seawall. Um, but just things were a little bit unusual that night. The clouds seemed a bit sort of, you know, it, it, it was going to be a full moon that, that evening. Um, but I sort of, I'd gone for a funny time that particular day because it was one of those occasions where I'd listened to a radio show that particular day and I'd pulled over um, and I'd usually been rushing a 100 mile an hour in my job. To, you know, I was out on the road and I was trying to, trying to sort of get from one appointment to another, one pressured sort of meeting to the next. And um, for, for whatever reason, I happened to turn the radio on that day and um, someone was just talking on the radio about how most of us have sort of got out of alignment and we've sort of been so driven with business and bonuses and materialism and big houses and big cars, which was pretty much my life at the time. Um, and I just, something had resonated, like these things happen, something had resonated inside me and I'd actually pulled over for 20 minutes or so and listened to this radio show and this guy was just sort of talking and this, you know, something dinged inside of me because this guy had on the outside everything and yet inwardly he was poor um, and it really resonated with me and coming back to the sort of, the, you know, the, the, the evening, when I'm bombing along on the on the sea wall or the you know uh, this wall that is about 20 foot above the sea um this conversation just hung around in my mind like these things do when something sort of profound is is happening inside of us and this conversation just kept niggling away at me sort of you know almost battling there was two selves inside me one that was saying well you're doing very well and you've got your big cars and your bonuses and your you know your big holidays to disney and all the rest of it kids wanted for nothing my wife had a new car every year um but there was just this other niggling sort of that uh, there wasn't much meaning and purpose there and um, um I, i'm sort of heading along really fast as you know it's sort of about eight o'clock at night the sun's going down not many people about it's this time of year april and the wind's starting to pick up and i just noticed that the, the sea was starting to dramatically shift it had gone from being very still and it was starting to chop up which normally happens on a sort of full moon and um 
uh, I'm riding along on my push bike, there's no one about, and suddenly this freak wave um, from nowhere came sort of above the 20 foot wall, um, absolutely sort of drenched me, pushed me off my bike, and I knocked against the seat, um, against the wall. There was a railway track there um, with a small sort of three foot high wall and the, the wave sort of bashed me against the wall and the water didn't have anywhere to go so it rushed sort of down back over the sort of the algae covered um, wall downwards but unfortunately I'd lost my sort of balance and um, I'd caught it as well and um, before I knew it I'm tumbling backwards towards the rocks below um, and it's all, all things are going through my mind thinking I'm going to smash my head on the rocks luckily I sort of landed between a couple of rocks in the freezing cold water, sort of hit the, the water with a burst. I can like remember sort of being a bit dazed, but coming back up for air and absolutely elated, I sort of punched the air, um, thinking I've survived, you know, I've been lucky and fortunate there. And then it starts to dawn on me, you know, every sort of five, ten seconds, the waves are bashing me up against this algae covered wall that's in the, sh in the shade. And um, I start to realise that... Um, you know, I'm in trouble now, and what am I going to do? And um, luckily, I was quite fit at that time. I was a semi-professional football player, um, and was probably as fit as I'd ever been at that, you know, in my life. And I sort of needed every bit of sort of um, energy to sort of think, you know, quickly and, you know, keep my head above the water because I was lots, I was starting to swallow a lot of seawater. And I it started to rapidly, you know, um, uh, I started to get to this point of realising I'm going to have to get away from the wall and use every bit of energy I can to sort of push my way away um, because otherwise I'm really in trouble here. And um, so I sort of managed over a sort of period of sort of a couple of minutes to sort of use every bit of energy I could to just get beyond the breakers and sort of get sort of, you know, 100 feet out and away. And then it just started to all settle down. Um, and at that point, you know, the waves weren't sort of, you know, I was only sort of riding the waves as opposed to being sort of slammed by them. Um, and then it sort of just started to dawn on me that, you know, how, the, how on earth am I going to get out of here? The sun's starting to disappear over the sea. Um, and what was probably even worse, which I can remember at the time just thinking the irony of it, the sea wall was sort of right on the edge of the town. Um, nobody would probably be walking out with their dogs as it gets dark, you know, um, people did felt a bit afraid that time of night. And um, the, the worst thing was, I looked up towards the church in the town centre, and this is a small town, probably about 10,000 people in Dawlish. And the ironic thing was, there was a row of houses right next to the church, and I can actually see my house, we had a big sort of three-story house, um, it was the home that I'd always dreamed of, a Georgian sort of home, white face, you know, um, three story. And I could actually see the light um, in my children's bedroom from a distance, bearing in mind this is probably about half a mile away. Um, but I could still see their, their light and think, you know, they're going to bed. And, you know, my wife's probably up with them reading a the story. And I, you know, nobody knows I'm fighting for my life here. And I can just remember that sort of horrible sensation and feeling of thinking nobody knows I'm here, nobody can come and find me, nobody can come and try and help me and um, it just, over the period of like an hour, I just start to really, you know, and I'm struggling to sort of, you know, paddle water to, to keep sort of um, afloat um, and then it just, all these things start to go through your mind that, you know, I don't really think I'm going to get out of here and I didn't have the energy to sort of swim towards the shore and if I did there's no point because you know I'm going to get slammed up against the wall again and it's at that point that the hypothermia um, started to really kick in um, and, and then you start to just get to this real realisation that this is it. This is really it. And, um, you know, I could start, you know, there's pains in my body. Imagine all the organs in my body. They were all starting to, obviously, after an hour, you know, it's freezing cold. They're starting to shut down. And I knew I was getting a, an aching, you know, kidneys at the back. And my heart was sort of throbbing. And I was getting a sore throat with the seawater that, you know, I was doing quite well. Making sure I could gauge when the next wave would hit with every sort of 10 seconds or so. But even then, I'd get caught out and... And suddenly, you know, I'd start to shake. And um, it's at that point that you start to realise that 
you know, this is how you're going to die. And um, it's, a, it's an awful feeling because, you know, my daughters were sort of, I think, about six and eight at the time. Um, and I just started to realise that, uh, you know, I'm not going to see them again. I'm not going to see my wife again. All sorts of weird things go through your mind. Like, you know, I'm thinking, well, she's got life insurance. She's going to be okay. But it sort of broke my heart that, you know, all the things that we want to tell the people that mean most to us in our lives, um, the best way, someone's often, often asked me, what does it actually feel like knowing that you're going to die quickly or within an hour or so? And I said, the, the, the best way that probably describes it is imagine someone coming along and taking you in a little white room and sort of, you know, shutting the door and then saying, right, OK, Bill, you've got an hour to live. Sorry, you can't say goodbye to all the people that you love. And um, pretty much in the next hour, it's going to be up. And there was this, this realisation, I'm not going to see my daughters get married. I'm not going to see them possibly have children. Um, I'm not going to say goodbye to my friends. And the, and the worst thing than that, I thought, well, somebody somewhere is going to probably find my body in a real hell of a state in, in the next couple of days or weeks or perhaps not at all. But, you know, our people, people obviously knew I was under stress and, and, and um had a you know, really high power job and I thought are people going to think that I've committed suicide because I'm not going to be there to tell the story and I think that that was that was you know as well as missing my wife and my children the fact of thinking that everyone thought I must have topped myself um was, was just as depressing and, and sad as I you know as anything else so after sort of this realization and this real anger you know then you get this wave of anger that comes in of oh, you know Often when people come to the end of their life, it's not all the silly and stupid things that they've, um, um, you know, that they've regretted. It's often all the things they didn't do. And there was so much that I promised myself that I was going to do in my life. And that's what I really felt sad about is all the, you know, all the stupid things that I put off till the next day or, you know, I said I'm going to do next year. I just felt a sort of a sense of, you know, I mean, I always remember Wayne Dyer sort of talking about, uh, you know, the biggest fear people have when they're ready, you know, at the end of their life is that you, nobody wants to die with the music still in them. And I can just remember that sort of constantly going through my mind. Um, you know, I felt that I was dying with still a lot of the music. You know, I'd always wanted to write. I'd always wanted to do this and, and, and you know, various things that were going through my mind and I thought I'm not going to be able to you, you know to, to potentially do any of them and that was really sad so when I'd got past this sort of anger stage there was a sort of stillness that started to come in and um and you know that, that was at that stage that I really started to sort of come in and out of consciousness um and that's when all this you know the unusual visions and um i mean do you want me to carry on anthony or did you yeah, fine i'll just i'll just pop the buzz in here and then we will continue with this I, I think every time you tell me this story and this experience it really moves me because you actually describe what it is like to realize you're going to die and people never ever think about that i don't think they think about the circumstances by which you'll die and whether it's going to be painful, whether it's going to be traumatic and everything else. But you're in this horrible situation of being aware of the fact that death was imminent and that the chances of you being saved under those circumstances were, were highly unlikely. So you had time to think about your life. And as you said, you know, with the music still in you, what a wonderful term. Because it says so much, doesn't it? Now, one of the things in my first book, Is There Life After Death, is I discuss this way in which it does seem that under certain circumstances, certain near-death experiences that are particularly powerful ones, are ones whereby the person who is about to die is aware that death is inevitable. You know, it's, it's, it's this, like mountain climbers that fall, you know, and they're falling for about 20 seconds or whatever. And they're aware of the fact that death is about to happen or people in car crashes and these kind of things. They seem to have a very different kind of approach. A near-death experience that happens under these circumstances seems to allow the body or something inside the body or something inside the psyche to prepare itself. And I think that near-death experiences under these circumstances, as Albert Heim, who was the guy that wrote a very important book about near-death experiences, and particularly something called the Panoramic Life Review, he, he interviewed many people who've been involved in mountaineering accidents. And there was a high number of people who had flashbacks to their own past. 
and to periods in their own past. And this is exactly what took place with you. Now, the important thing to stress here to the, the listeners of this program and this podcast is that before this happened, this was something that Bill was not even vaguely interested in. He was in a high powered job. His world just didn't involve these kind of things. But here is somebody who has an experience that he wasn't expecting. He hadn't read about near-death experiences. Therefore, everything that now Bill will tell us was happening to somebody who would have rejected, probably out of hand, the things that happened. And this is of profound importance. So, Bill, so you're in the water, your body's shutting down, you've got hypothermia taking place. You suddenly have what's called the oceanic feeling. Can you explain what then happened to you? Yeah, so the, the sun's almost disappeared and it's that sort of twilight and I'm looking up to the town and all the lights are starting to go on. I'm looking at my house, you know, knowing that my wife and children are there in bed. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I've gone past the rage. I've gone past the sort of um, denial. I've gone past the, the, the feeling of sort of sadness about, you know, what, you know, and it's almost like an acceptance, it's like the cubular rust sort of, you've gone through the processes of, of death in a way, mini death. And, um, and, and I've got to this sort of stage of almost acceptance at the same time that I'm starting to drift in and out of consciousness. And I can just remember, um, the problem is, it's a bit like the best thing to, the best way to describe it is a bit like that, that few moments and seconds when you first either wake up in the morning or those moments when you're drifting off in the evening where you're not quite sure if you're here or there, you know, um, things sort of start to blur a bit, you know, you move on them different brain waves. And I started to sort of almost come in and out of consciousness. And I knew I was starting to really get in trouble because up until then, a lot of the pain, you know, a lot of the, the organs, when they start to shut down and start to sort of, you know, freeze, you know, the pain is just unbelievable. Well, what started to happen, the pain started to subside, and I actually started to get a warm feeling, and that really frightened me, because I actually started to feel quite good, and you start to realise that you're getting close to the edge, and um, it's a weird paradox, really, in some ways you're sort of, you know, you're relaxing into it, and another part of you is, doesn't want to let go because you pretty much know you're on them, la, them last legs then. And um, so I'm starting to get this lovely sort of warm feeling that I'm fighting and accepting at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, and then, bizarrely, I just started to get this... Um, um, this sort of recall, first of all, I mean, there's two stages to this. You know, there's the, um, the best way I can describe it is that if you could, if, if anyone listening can, can imagine the, say the dozen top emotional moments of your life. Now, that could be positive or negative, you know, um, watching your first child come into the world, getting married perhaps, you know, these are the nice things, you know, perhaps seeing your father and mother do a 50th wedding, you know, um, anniversary, um, you know, or negative things, you know, a couple of things that you might remember from your childhood or being really shamed and embarrassed. So, I, you know, I won't go into them, but there was there was quite a few of, of these moments. And it's almost like, and I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, I got knocked down as a child when I was uh, in London as an 11 year old and without watching the road I'd just run across and of course I'd got hit by a car and just you know car was going 40 miles an hour or something and luckily I'd stand on the side of the car anyway it completely sort of polaxed me and I'm sort of on the floor um and for a moment so so you know I'm in the water, but I'm reliving this moment that is very profound to me as an 11-year-old. But this time, I'm reliving it, and I can, you know, it's not like a memory, it's more than a memory, because I can actually feel the emotions inside my body. I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm, everything around me is, I, you know, if I look at my body, I'm an 11-year-old, and everything is happening as if I'm right back in that moment, reliving it. Only this time, the emotions are a lot heightened. I'm starting to feel things that I wouldn't normally have perhaps felt as an 11-year-old. There's a, there's a higher level of awareness. So I'm lying on the floor, being hit. I can hear the car crash into the, into the wall that had hit me. Um, I can hear all these voices in the background, but I'm literally out cold on the floor. 
listening to sort of all this screaming, I can hear this sort of woman um, running over to me, who I presume, you know, is the, the car driver, and she's screaming and she's on the floor, and I sort of, I can't remember if I open my eyes or not, but I'm aware that she's there absolutely sobbing. She thinks she's killed me, and everything's sort of happening in sort of slow motion, you know, as I'm recalling this event as an 11-year-old while I'm in the water. Um, so there's this weird sort of thing going on where these memories are coming back. Um, but the funny thing here is the memory just didn't stop there. The next thing that happened, again, I'm back in that moment as an 11-year-old. But bizarrely, this time, I'm not Bill the child, the 11-year-old. I, I'm I'm the um, the driver of the car, and we happen to be a Rolls Royce actually. Um, and um, I, I'm driving this car, and I actually look at myself as an 11 year old, and I look at my hands that on a steering wheel, and um, they're painted, so you know I'm, I know I'm the woman. Anyway, she hits me, who I think is me, um, and then crash into this sort of wall. And I can feel the palpitations and the fear of thinking I've killed this boy. And I realised I'm reliving the same scenario, only from her viewpoint, to feel what she feels and the agony and the, the frustration and the, the, the just actually sheer shock, you know, horrific sort of feelings that she's going through. And I, form a, I feel myself sort of falling out of the car. I rush over to the body, which is obviously me on the floor. I, but I just get to this point of realising that I'm replaying this whole thing to experience what this poor woman must have gone through. Now, bearing in mind in 1999 when I'm in the water, I'm what, 34 years old, 33, 34 years old, not until that very moment in the water had I ever given that poor woman any thought about what she must have gone through up until that point, you know, since being an 11-year-old. It just hadn't entered my consciousness. Um, and there was lots of other moments like that, uh, which I'm not going to go into, but there was lots of other replays, I would call them, only they seem to be, you know, from a higher level of consciousness. And these things just, you know, one minute I'm in the water and I'm looking up at the town and the lights and church and everything, and the next minute I'm back in this next replay from the past. Um, and all of these seem to sort of play out as if I needed to see them from a different level of consciousness. Um, and as if that wasn't, you know, the most bizarre thing, um, then I get right to, you know, near the end point of, of sort of almost accepting that pretty much. I've, I've done quite well in my life. I'm quite proud that I've had two children and got married um, and had a good life up until that point. I pretty much accepted that that's it, I'm, I'm finished. Um, and this inner peace started to sort of wash over me and... Um, you know, everyone must come to the end of their life. You know, I've got a few friends in palliative care. Um, that, and, I've, and actually, funny enough, I've got one of my best friends who's going literally through the last days of her life now. Um, very close friend of mine, which is quite painful. Um, but I, I, the only thing I can think of is that you must go through this final point of accepting that you're pretty much finished. And this warmth comes in and this acceptance when you stop fighting it. Um, and I pretty much sort of almost started to close my eyes and think, just take me and, and that's it. And then this voice, this, you know, bizarre voice came in and started to sort of make a conversation with me. Now, this is going to sound a bit strange, but we all have these voices, these inner dialogue, you know, this sort of... Um, you know, sometimes it's a condemning voice that condemns our own behaviour. You know, we do something and we hear this little voice come in that says, oh, don't be stupid, Bill, or, or, or whatever. This was that same type of sort of voice, but this time I was starting to have a dialogue. And what was bizarre, I, I got very confused at the beginning because this voice only normally talks in sound bites. You know, we've all got this in a dialogue. I don't very hard for people to sometimes accept, but it's not until you start thinking about it. We've all got it, and this inner dialogue is there, and sometimes it might come through as innovation or creativity. Sometimes it might come through as a condemning sort of um, you know, voice um, that criticizes, but it is there. And 
what the bizarre thing that was for me, I started to have a conversation with this voice because I would ask questions for him right at the end of my life, wanting to know, you know, what's going to be happening um, because I've always been curious. Um, and, and this voice started to enter into dialogue with me. And it literally felt like days, and, you know, I know people talk about squash time, I literally had this conversation with my higher self, this inner dialogue, call it whatever you want. But I had this voice and it just answered a lot of questions I had always had since childhood. And um, this seemed to go on for days, but actually what it turned out, you know, was an hour or so. Um, and I remember just getting right to the end of the conversation. And all this insight had come into me. And this image popped up in my head. Um, and I was in the hallway, uh, in my hallway at home. Um, and I was a present. So I knew I was in the hallway, but I couldn't actually see my body. And I was sort of drifting towards the front door. And there was a knock on the front door. Somehow the door had opened. And it was one of the, it wasn't one of the light you know, at the end of the tunnel things. But at the, at the, at the door was a policewoman and a policeman. And they had come to talk to my wife and said, sorry, Mrs. Martha, we found your husband's body. Uh, it was up in a beach just on the next cove along from the bush. Um, and we need you to come down and identify it. And I can just remember that realization at that moment, thinking I'm there, I'm experiencing this. And I now know, now know that I've died. And that I'm, what I'm doing is observing in whatever present form I'm in, or energy, or whatever's happened to me now, I've, I've died, and I'm observing this from a from a, some sort of weird place. And I just, it's just some, every piece of my being, whatever form I was in at that time, just sort of looked, you know, looked at the whole situation and thought, I'm not ready to die. I am absolutely not ready to die. And I got really emotional. I, I, I didn't know I had a body, so I, I don't know. You know, there was some sort of feeling element there. Um, and I just remember thinking, I don't want to die. I'm not ready. I've got too much to do. And the moment I made that conscious decision that it wasn't, I wasn't ready to die. I'm not ready to sort of go forward. All the imagery, you know, the two police, the policewoman, the policeman, my wife, the, the hallway of my home, just dissolved. I'm back in the water, but as opposed to that feeling that I'd left, which was that peace, calm, I couldn't feel the cold, all my organs, I'm back in the water, flashing around in the dark, looking up to the sort of town again, and um, I'm thinking, I'm back in the water, and it, the pain had come whoosh, straight back in, and... Um, I just remember looking, and suddenly I realised that there was a light in the, in the um, near the shore, and there was a block of flax. I just, you know, being that I was a, you know, somewhere in between an agnostic and sort of, you know, an atheist, I done something that must have just been instinctual. I actually started to pray, and I'd never probably prayed for most of my life, but it just seemed like it was the right thing to do. I didn't know what or who I was praying to. I just remember looking at this building, there was a top floor flat and the light was on. I could see a shadow. I didn't even know. It was so far away. I didn't even know if it was a man or a woman. And I just remember saying, please, if there's anyone out there, just please see me and see if you can save me. And I turned away again and I'm really trying to concentrate to, to keep my, you know, to keep floating in the, in the water. Um, the sun's pretty much gone now and it's dark. And um, the, the moon, full moon, was sort of, you know, between across the sea. And I just remember turning away, and then in my mind, I thought it was in my mind, I heard a shout. And um, I looked over towards the shore, so I'm about, you know, by now about 100 metres up, which is, you know, about 300 up from the, from the coast. And I just thought in my mind, I heard this voice, and I turned around, and I saw this guy waving. And to begin with, so I thought it was a bit of a mirage, because... You know, I thought, in my mind, playing tricks on me. And this guy just kept shouting. And the reason I knew he was there and it was real, because he said the most ridiculous thing, which was, you know, he shouted out, do you want help? And I just remember that it was the best thing that he could have said at the time, because it was like an electric shock. I just thought, is this guy insane or something? Do I need help? After everything I've gone through, 
Of course I want to help. Um, and I can remember it was just that sort of, that, that energy spurt that I needed. And at that time, it was almost like I'd raised my level another two or three layers. And I just remember thinking, you know, I'm going to survive it. And it was at that point, for the first time in probably two hours, I thought, I'm going to survive it. I am absolutely, I've gone through it all. I've gone through this amazing experience. I've gone through this conversation, this replay of experiences from my childhood and past. I am absolutely going to get out of this. I don't know how or why yet. Anyway, so I, I looked over to the shore, and where this guy had been waving at me, there was a crowd starting to build, and I could see torches going on, and people were shouting at me. It was all a bit sort of in and out of consciousness, and I'm really trying to survive the cold. So I'm not really sort of fully aware or being able to focus on the shore. All I know is that they managed to fire, um, um, uh, which I found out in retrospect now, um, they fired one of these um, um, orange boys out to me, and I, I couldn't, it, it wasn't going anywhere near me. And somehow in the course of, I've, by, you know, I've probably lost the sense of time by now, but over so many minutes, whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, this boy seemed to come closer and closer to me, um, miraculously, I don't know how. And I remember that this sort of orange boy, a couple of feet long, coming really close to me. But by now, my hands were um, full of hypothermia. I just couldn't, um, I couldn't grab it. And this is where the bizarre thing really happened. Um, I was getting really frustrated. I just couldn't have any sensation in my hands. So I couldn't grab this, this sort of survival boy. And there was a voice and it came in the, you know, in the back of my head somewhere. And, you know, from nowhere. And this voice just said, look for the rope at the end. And I just grabbed the boy again and looked, and there was about a metre of um, um, like a noose at the end of it. And I just remember being shocked about this voice and where it come from. Um, but I managed to sort of put my arm in the noose and sort of just really clamp my body, you know, my arms closely to my body. And what transpired for the next sort of 10 minutes or so is they managed to pull, well, there was a group of people apparently that managed to pull my body along the coast where the high wall was to a point where the um, inlet, where the boats went in, and it was about 400 yards, something like that, that's where I bust, you know, busted all my, my ribs up, and I just remember them sort of dragging me out and, and just sort of slipping in and out of consciousness, and it was a bit like sort of a sheer relief of getting, and by now there's a, you know, there's a few other people at the shore and all can see is torches and shouts and screaming. So I'm, I'm not really aware of properly what's going on. All I do remember is they're, they've got me on a stretcher and I'm being whizzed up and down a zigzag sort of path back up to the road. And one minute I'm sort of conscious, the next minute I'm not. And then I open my eyes again and I'm in a, um, an ambulance looking at the lights at the top of the ceiling. And all I can sort of, remember in that journey, which apparently was about half an hour, was that I'm slipping in and out of consciousness, and all I can hear in the background every now and again, they were fighting to try and keep my body temperature up, um, and got me, they did get me eventually to the hospital, um, and then they worked on me that night, and, um, you know, it was, uh, next morning, I just was just shocked and amazed at watching the sun come up in this sort of hospital bed in, um, in Torquay, where, um, you know, I had all drips around me and everything, and, you know, you can't really process what you've gone through. I remember thinking, where am I, you know, where on earth am I going to start telling this conversation, or probably not tell it, because it's so extraordinary that I don't think I know I'm going to how to frame this. So, um, yeah, that was the, that, the amazing part of the water story, anyway. Well, the thing is here, there are so many elements here, of, as you and I have discussed many, many times in terms of my own writing, because I know an awful lot of people find my concept of the daemon somewhat difficult to accept. I have no idea why they find the concept of the daemon difficult to accept, the idea that we all have a form of higher self, a higher consciousness that shares our lives with us. And clearly... On two or three occasions here, and probably more times from, you know, the conversations we've had, there was something inside of you that was greater than you, that was communicating with you, that seemingly had knowledge that you didn't have, 
about your life. I mean, effectively, you know, the fact that it was aware of what you needed to grab when the boy was fired towards you, when your everyday self, what I would call your Eagleon, was blissfully unaware of this. Now, there are quite a few other things that you mentioned there that really need to be focused in on. For instance, your 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 description of the way in which when you started to die you went into this altered state of consciousness. Now the altered state of consciousness that you're describing there is something you're both well aware of, I know, but maybe some of the people in the audience are not necessarily aware of. It's something called hypnagogia or hypnopompia. And it's this kind of liminal state when we're in particular periods of stress or when we're just lying semi-awake, our mind seems to move into an area that is between this consciousness and this awareness and another form of awareness that we broaden out our awareness. Now, when people do this, um, there was a guy called Dr. Buck who may have run about 120 years ago, came up with the idea of what he called oceanic consciousness. And this is the idea that we start to realize that we're not a singular entity. The ego seems to be drawn away and it is replaced by our accessing or our understanding of a greater consciousness that we are all part of. And that consciousness is embodied in everybody. Now, this is why it's so reinforced by your incident with the, with the lady that hit you in the car. Because you were, seem to be swapping emotional experiences with a total stranger. And you were perceiving reality from the viewpoint of that stranger. Now, again, this is intriguing because it again suggests that at some subliminal level, we are able to understand the emotions of other people as if there is a form of life energy that we're all part of. And it is only during these kind of near-death experiences that consciousness broadens out, the doors of perception are opened wider for us to appreciate, in literal terms, the wider understanding. Now, I remember you saying something in the book um, about the fact that when you were in the water, you started to realize the oneness of the cliffs you could see and the trees and the seagulls and the birds and everything else, and the realization, the oneness of, of the world around us. So it seems that we it's only in these times of extreme stress or extreme somethingness that we start to really appreciate what we really are. Now, there were so many elements of your experience that are fulfilled the elements of the moody traits or the Grayson traits of the near-death experience. Now, again, you were not to know that at the time, but, you know, the time slowing down, the panoramic life review, the meeting of the being of light, the entity that communicates with you, all of these elements are all classic elements of the NDE experience that have been reported since ancient Greek times, you know, this is not as if this is a new phenomenon. It is something that has been known for so long. And here's Bill in the water in 1999, a, 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 a real cool dude, a hedonist, really living his life to the nth degree, suddenly has this most profound spiritual experience. Now, my associate, um, Dr. Penny Satori, very much writes about this idea of the the, the way in which these experiences change us as human beings. We suddenly see the world in a very, very different way. We see the unity of humanity. We see the beauty of the world around us, and it helps us focus that. And I know that this is what happened to you. But before we move on, I'd just like to, to explain something as well, that this particular event was quite famous at the time in that there was a British TV program, a network TV program, I think it was on the BBC, which was, I think, Michael Burke did it. And yeah, it was Burke. featured, and it was featured on national television, wasn't it? You know, your experience. Yeah, so many million people, yeah. How many watched it? 15 million people, yeah. See, so here we have some places. Like so this is not Bill making this up. We know that these events actually happened because they became a huge event at the time. But the, the end of the story for this section is the bit I find really, really interesting. It is how Bill was saved. Now, this to me moves into areas of synchronicity. It moves into areas of fate. But it ties the story round in the most weird and strange way. So, Bill, if you can explain the telescope and how it all happened, because, guys, this will blow your mind. Yeah, I mean, 
it still sends a shudder down my um you know because i i didn't really know at that time you know you, you you pitched it well you know i wasn't in any one degree spiritually minded i didn't read any well, I, up until that point and this sounds ridiculous i had quite a hard upbringing um which I, later in yes, later years i ended up discovering i had dyslexia and dyspraxia um but i didn't know it because we didn't have any terms for it when i was growing up um it's like these things have always been there but we didn't have terms to gauge them you know a metric against so i you know i had this sort of um um you know problem with with reading so i'd never um read a book from about 14 years old up until 33 34 so tw for 20 years i had not read a single book that hadn't stopped me from getting to the top of my profession um but it just you know reading for me every time i picked up a book i was straight back in that classroom as a 14 year old being you know absolutely you know slaughtered by an english teacher because in then that you know in them days you had to read out a, a paragraph of a passage perfectly and you could sit down and of course i'd be there all day you know it's much the annoyance of the class um so of course i had a paranoia about reading um and i just didn't want to read you know so um anyway i sort of um i'd got to um uh, not know about any spiritual practice um i'd not read anything you know i was just going along doing my life so that that is the context of where i was at the time but anyway i'm sort of i'm waking up in the hospital the next morning um and there was a guy there and he had a drip um and he walked over to the um um the window and we both watched the sun come up and it's funny Anthony you mentioned about the oneness feeling you know with the cliffs I, I didn't explain it obviously with the cliffs and seagull and this sort of feeling of oneness that I'd never experienced in my life up until that point of the accident in the water but me and this guy we looked out of this talkie hospital you know glass sort of you know ceiling to floor looked out the sun coming up over the, the, the hill and we looked at each other and there was a deep deep connection of life force between us we didn't need to say anything obviously by the looks of him he was probably in his 70s he'd gone through a major operation or something you know i'd gone through the experience the night before but we looked at each other's eyes and there was this knowing there was this sort of wow you know of life and i at that morning, I remember them sort of, you know, the hospital was just gradually trying to get my temperature to sort of settle down and to sort of, you know, gradually more drips off of me. And I was sort of just trying to bring my body back into sort of centre, really. And then my wife came in in the morning. Um, but funny thing, in the afternoon, um, uh, a really sort of hassled matron come in and sort of said, I'm really getting, you know, a bit irritated. There's some reporters downstairs and they want to interview. And I told them they can't. And, um, you know, um, you know, I told them to go away. And I said, well, I don't mind honestly seeing them, you know. Um, and uh, I wonder what the, the fuss was about because, you know, I playing football, we were a couple of games away from playing at the greatest stadium in the country, which is the Wembley Stadium, and, you know, we were only a couple of games away from playing in the final, and I thought the local paper, because uh, we were in the paper most weeks for our soccer sort of, you know, uh, achievements, and, um, you know, we were a couple of games away from the final, I thought they wanted to perhaps interview me for that and say, am I still going to be able to play, and all the rest of it, um, but no, I went to meet this reporter, and this guy is sort of I clearly, you know, in the first few seconds, I realised he wasn't interested in the sort of soccer conversation. And um, he said, I want to interview about the accident and about the um, the way you survived. And I said, well, how do, how do you know all this? Who's giving you all the information? And he said, well, right now, while I'm interviewing you, one of my colleagues is down um, on the seafront. And this is a national and local newspaper. So it got in quite a lot of local news and he said we're interviewing the guy that apparently spotted you and um i said well i don't know anything about this obviously this is all new to me and he said oh this is an amazing story he said um the, the guy's called nathan and um he lives in a flat that it sort of overlooks and the way he described this flat it's almost in the area of the of the building that i looked out at the top of the um the light where um um where the guys, well, where there was a silhouette of, of a person, and the, when I was starting to pray in the in the water, and uh, but I knew it was that sort of block of flats because only one main block of flats there, um, 
And um, he said, yeah, this guy's been sort of talking to all different papers and local papers and, you know, about the extraordinary sort of events. I said, well, you better tell me more. Anyway, he went on to describe that um, the guy, Nathan, um, had a flatmate. And for the last nine months, his flatmate had a beautiful new telescope and um, had been saying to Nathan that I'll lend it to you soon, I'll lend it to you soon. Anyway, Nathan almost got fed up with this because it was one of those promises that never seems to happen. And on the very afternoon of the evening I went in the water, this guy, for whatever reason, decides that he's going to go and lend Nathan a telescope because it was going to be a full moon that night. So Nathan had set up the telescope, you know, happily to sort of, you know, lived in a, uh, a one floor sort of um, flat um, and um, he set the telescope up to look at the sort of full moon, gone away to the back of his flat where his kitchen was to make a drink, um, came back um, and um, uh, realised that the telescope, for whatever reason, had dropped. Now, Nathan... What turns out, which I found out about later from the media and from when I personally met Nathan a few days later, Nathan said I had the most bizarre feeling. He said, I should have just tilted the telescope back up towards the moon and carried on. But he said, I don't know why I had this gut feeling to just look through the telescope. And he said, at the very point that I looked through, there was something crashing around in the water. Now, bearing in mind, it's dark by now, and the moonlight's sort of shimmering across the water. He said, first of all, I thought there was a couple of seagulls sort of fighting or something in the water. And he said, then I suddenly realised there was a guy with a head, or a person with a head. And he said, I just sort of looked at it in amazement and then called the, the 999 um, Coast Guard. Then I sort of realised this guy's struggling and we better go down. And, you know, there was other people down by the coastline. Um, but Nathan said nothing like that has ever happened to him before that. And he said, you know, nine months he'd been asking for that telescope. And, um, you know, we just sat, I just remember a few days after, just sat with Nathan. And um, funny enough, he'd actually found the bike that had been washed up a few days later and asked if, if he could have it. And I said, well, of course you can. You just saved my life. And, you, you know, I mean, I don't know if anyone's out there that's sort of had their lives saved by anyone, but money just doesn't seem appropriate you just don't know what to say to that apart from you know the immense amount of gratitude but no no amount of money just seems that it's appropriate and um you know i just remember sat there in in tears talking to nathan and just as he was telling me this telescope i'm just thinking wow this this was my time to stay here i mean you know there's just too many dominoes that line up for for coincidence really Wow, every time I hear that, it just takes my breath away. And because it is recorded, because it was covered by the press, there is nobody out there that can turn around and say that this is exaggerated in any shape or form. Now, this is what shakes my tree. This is the reason I do what I do. This is the reason I write the things I write about. I know that there are some people out there that, 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 that criticise me for various reasons. But these experiences, Bill's experience here, these are genuine experiences that are happening by, with genuine people, where people are having the impossible happening. Now, it is really easy to turn around and say that the plural of anecdotes is not data. But that's beside the point. The point of the matter is that people have these experiences, and it is bad science, very bad science, to just dismiss these out of hand and pretend that they're what? Hallucinations? We don't even know what hallucinations are, but there you go, guys. We'll give it a nice little label to explain it. We call it a near-death experience. We turn around and say that the near-death experience is just part of the process of the dying brain. So the dying brain will take Will back to the time he was a child and will then put, embody him in that body and then embody him in somebody else's body during an incident like that. And we know that there were other incidents that, that you actually had. But on top of this, it also showed you the alternate future. It showed you a future that could happen had you not been saved. Now, 
Is this an application of Everett's many worlds interpretation of quantum physics? Is this the idea that these realities do exist? It's just the wave function of that reality has not been collapsed. And you were in a position where you were out in what Philip K. Dick called orthogonal time. It's the time that you can look at where you see the alternate futures. Now we know that Herman Minkowski still talked about this. We know that uh, people like um, uh, various scientists have argued that that the future is already out there, ready to come into existence, depending upon the choice of a conscious mind. This is not nonsense. It is far from it. This is the discoveries of quantum physics. So here we have this. And then we have this wonderful alternate story of how you were saved. Now, the chances of that happening are in the realms of the ridiculous. You know, it ties it together in the most amazing way. Now, Bill, we're getting towards the end now in terms of, of, the, of the, the, the interview and everything else. Can you tell people a little bit about what you're doing now? Tell them about the book and tell them about, you know, the future work that you're planning to do. Because I know that you, you've changed your worldview, particularly now you're working as a philanthropist. You're doing lots of other different types of work. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing for a few more minutes. And then if you can tell if anybody wants to contact you, if everybody's interested in getting hold of the book, how they can do so. Right, so uh, there is absolutely no doubt that these transformative, you know, transformative experiences have a major, major profound effect on your life. You know, it's almost like suddenly, you know, you used to see the world like that, and then suddenly it's, it, you know, your lens of the world has just expanded. And for me personally, uh, most people that have near-death experiences don't wake up the next day a changed person because you've got a lot of processing to do. And that's what I end up doing for, for nine months, actually. Well, more, more than that, actually, over a year, you know, because you can't fathom or process so much of this stuff, particularly coming from a standing start like I did. So I had a really bad year after the accident, holding it in, not sharing it. I, how do you share something like that? Well, you know, and then it gets to a point where your consciousness is so full and your emotions are just so brimming that something bursts out. And for your own sanity, you know, you have to start sharing it. And I remember sharing it with my best friend at the, at the time. Well, still is my best friend, Simon, at the time. Um, and just starting to grow. And then so I couldn't, because me and my wife were going through, you know, not a particularly great time in our marriage. I didn't tend to sort of feel that she would trust me or want to listen to it um, because we just weren't in a good place in our marriage at the time. But my best friend, we'd have conversations every day about it at length because it was so extraordinary. And what it forced me to do is to sort of change my direction in my career. Um, I came out of the construction and sort of development um, industry. Um, I, I then tried to start my own company because I sort of believed that that would be a new start. But then I started to realize that, no, that's not the reason I, I survived the water, you know. And I really started to get into a point of writing my story down. I found a writing tutor. You know, confidence was the biggest thing for me as a dyslexic to break through. Um, for anyone, you know, that's got dyslexia, it's, it's awful because you might have this great story trapped inside of you and you haven't got a vehicle to deliver it. So, you know, I was fortunate, a good friend of mine, Katie Clark, um, um, that, you know, she taught me to write from the ground upwards and it gave me a body of, of, of experience and a vehicle to get this work out there. And then Dying for a Change was the sort of launch pad. Um, you know, I then decided to, um, interview 500 leaders um which i call visionaries because I, I was really fascinated where the world was going and, and i wanted to interview leaders from all types of sort of sectors including science and medicine and business and arts and music so i ended up spending sort of four or five years on some, a project called the global visionaries project um of which mr peak is part of um and um <laughs> um, and it was just great because it really started to open my mind up that there's people out there that are absolutely dedicated to creating a new way of living, a new way of, of business, a new way of, you know, a new form of capitalism, but where people actually are not treated like robots, that they can bring their best selves forward to do good work. And um, uh, all around that time, you know, I started to become very interested that, that 
people um, are interested in change, particularly personal change, because first of all, we've got to do work on the personal change before we can change businesses or societies or economics. So it all comes down to personal change. So I trained up with the um, uh, with my wife, uh, Jane, and we trained up with the Institute of Leadership Management and um, we've become professional coaches and we now go into businesses um, coaching people on transformation. And, um, you know, I, I just love this work because so many people out there, including people of big, you know, some people I'm coaching are the sort of directors of multi-million pound companies. Um, and it's not until you start to work with them and realize what is going on. You know, to the outside world, their persona, their image, their everything about them speaks and shouts success. It's not until you get the bonnet up on their personality and what really bugs them at the moment, you start to realise they might be in a, a really awkward place in a minute and they're, they're sort of a bit lost and they're a bit sort of looking for meaning in their life and purpose. And I think so many people, you know, none of us know what battles are going on inside of everyone. And um, I just really believe that, um, you know, there's this change sort of happening out there and we just enjoy it this sort of transformational coaching because it's helping people to sort of form a new life but also help them to 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 bring you know their best selves forward and um yeah if people want to contact me i'm you know um I'm, we're now going into companies and sort of helping people at that first three months of uh, you know which tends to be the hardest time uh, most challenging time of a, a new job is when you first go in and you're feeling unsupported you're trying to get a handle on a new career and a new culture and um i think you know this coaching is just going to get busier and busier and um and it great, gives great rewards you know you get a really good sense of fulfillment helping people to to to, to create a new life for themselves and um yeah if anyone wants to contact me it's um it's bill at s r s u k dot com Excellent. And the book? And the book, if anybody wants to get hold of the book? And the book is, um, there's a book on transformational media, which is called Dying for Change. Um, and then there's another book, which is um, uh, Visionaries, 100 Words, uh, both American books. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, I'm working on the third book now. Excellent. Bill, it's, as always, it's wonderful to talk to you, and I know we've, we've had lots of long chats in the past as well, so all I can say is thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Murtho, one of the most incredible guys who's had the most incredible experience. Right, okay, folks, that's all for, for, for this month's uh, edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Next month, we've got uh, a returning guest. We've got uh, Jim Elvidge, um, the American writer who deals with the idea that this, this university is a simulation. Um, Jim has featured earlier on. Jim has a new book coming out, so we're very, very keen and very keen to chat with him about his new book. Uh, as always, thank you very much for Radia Nunez, who is always there in the background making things happen in the right way, because without Radia, I could not do this. Uh, I am absolutely sure that probably it is less hot in Denver than it is in here. I've just actually checked. The temperature in here at the moment is 36 degrees, which is utterly ridiculous for the UK in April. But uh, that's one of those things. OK, thank you very much for joining us and we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>